Hey Mike, welcome back. Thank you, it's great to be back. Mike, let's talk a bit about Kronos in an overview. Like, where are you at right now with the whole evolution of everything you've got going? Yeah, everything, we're, we're in great shape. So uh, I think the story the last, uh, last year or so was sort of building, getting the platform ready. And uh, this year and where we are now, it's execution. So it's been, we're, we're expanding, we're expanding. Now the expansions, uh, at least a few of them are online and we're, and we're seeing great yields, seeing great quality and great reviews from, uh, from patients. Cool. Uh, so continuing you know, the growth in international markets, uh, making sure we can fill distribution channels. We're having uh, Israel uh, continuing to have great progress there. Sure. So we're very happy with where we're at. Mm -hmm. The uh, announcement by Jeff Sessions that he's going to kill the coal memo in the United States, that doesn't have any effect on Kronos. You don't have U.S. operations. No, it doesn't. You know, it's actually interesting. So if you recall, I, I came from New York. Uh, I moved up here. I started on the investment side. And the thesis I had a few years ago, which I think has, has since been validated, was that uh, investing in U.S. cannabis assets would be very challenging, and for us, it's always come down to IP. So we wanted to move to Canada where it's federally legal, build up our IP, uh, understand how to how to you know have capacity that's scalable, have product quality that's you know beyond what we've been able to have access to without you know, real long-term uh, you know, going concern businesses. Mm -hmm. So the plan was always to come to Canada to build to go rest of world, and when the U.S. finally does become federally legal we would move back down. So this is, uh, I think, really just validation for a model. I think it actually strengthens us. Mm -hmm. you know, the, that's, I guess, as a, as a CEO, uh, as, a, as a citizen there, you know, and I'm a dual citizen. I think it's I a lot of friends that have businesses there. I think it's really unfortunate. Uh, I think that at, at a minimum, we should see some type of research opened up in, in the U.S. to allow for, you know, for still the furthering of, uh, of health care. But mm -hmm. As far as business, does not it doesn't affect us uh, negatively. If anything, I think it's a positive. Okay, enough about Jeff Sessions in the <laughs> U.S. Let's talk about happier things. Uh, how, what's your production profile looking like right now? How many strains are you growing? What's your patient count? What's the revenue picture look like for 2018? Sure. So it's uh, you know it's great. Um, we've I'd say we we have a skew rotation. So what we like to do is we have about uh, eight to twelve uh, strains that we always keep. We always have them in stock. Uh, we, patients want consistent medicine. And then I'd say at any given time over the next six months, we'll probably have 43 total strains that we'll have available. So we have limited editions that we on a, on a continuing basis rotate. People that want to ride, if you want to try new things, if you have a different ailment, how do you know what works for you? So it's mm. a, lot of, uh, a lot of tinkering, a lot of R&D. Uh, we'll probably over the next few years have about 150 that we put through the rotation. And as we get feedback, we'll decide to keep them for longer or make them more limited. Uh, you know, patients, I'd have to, I'd have to start tracking uh, Germany because we've got quite a few shipments there. Uh, we can track by pharmacies, but we could, we could send uh, 10 times our production to Germany and, uh, and still the feedback we would get is... Uh, it would all be taken up. <laughs> no, please send more. Right. Can you send more? Uh, uh, Canada, you know, we're, we're seeing great upticks in yeah. uh, and, and revenue. Yeah, we're, we're excited. In terms of production, uh, we're... You know, we've got uh, three buildings all firing now. Uh, the greenhouse is coming online. How many square feet in total green growing space? In actual production growing mm -hmm. space, that gets us to uh, 68,000. 68,000. And do you have plans? I mean, it's the trend seems to be heading towards million square foot plus greenhouses. Mm -hmm. Is that something that Kronos has in the plans for the future? Yeah, and there's two different things that you look for. And on the greenhouse side, you have to think about what you're ultimately getting. And if and one of our priorities, especially for adult use market and for uh, pharmaceutical flour, is having premium indoor production. So eventually there will be a scenario where supply does catch up with demand, and that's when the focus on quality is there. And we never want to sacrifice quality just to announce we have capacity. Hmm. I also think there's this idea like uh, funded capacity. There's a magic capacity store. I've yet to find out where this is, where... Uh, you know, you're, you're currently growing 500 uh, kilos, or, or maybe you've never harvested at all, and since you've just done this convertible debt-bought deal, suddenly you have 100,000 kilos. Uh, <laughs> someone tells me where it is, it's great, but... Uh, <laughs> Funded capacity, yeah, that's a new metric. But yeah, as far as, uh, as, far as million, million square foot greenhouses, you know, the way, way we look at it is uh, at least half of the market will be uh, derivative products. Mm -hmm. And you can grow for derivative products, and there are advantages to greenhouses. Uh, you don't have the same control that you'll have indoor, but uh, we certainly think that uh, I wouldn't look at it as a million square feet, two million square feet. A lot of it is what you do with the space, but there are, is a lot of agricultural infrastructure out there 
where the products are lower margin today. There's uh, already labor in place, and that's the, you know the kibbutz we went to in Israel. That was a big you know big factor. It's 5,000 acres. They grow food and they export to 35 different countries. There, hmm. a million square feet is not difficult. It's a thousand on-site members that are skilled agricultural laborers there. Labor there. We could. We could build way more than, uh, or even convert more than a million square feet. It wouldn't take us long at all. We already have the team that can build it. So I think leveraging that infrastructure rather than trying to uh, sort of do everything greenfield is, is a huge part of our strategy. And we, we certainly need a lot of capacity to fill the international channels we have. Sure. So uh, you'll probably see some of that. Okay. Are you concerned at all that the Canadian government's commitment to increase the licenses in, for ACMPR growers mm -hmm. to by a factor of uh, three times up to, mm -hmm. by, the, by that math, call it uh, 240 licenses within the next, in the near term time frame. Is that in any way a concern for you and what you're doing? No, I actually think if you were just to say, remove all licenses and everyone just has to be complying with the regulations, I still don't think it would affect in any way the, the scenario we're in. You know, when I think of where most of the capacity is likely to come from, I would say that there is probably six to eight LPs that are going to make up uh, 80 to 90 percent of the capacity. If you look at the trajectory of expansion of being able to actually you know, get to some scale, uh, over the first two years that licenses were issued, look at, look at where you know, scale is. Mm -hmm. The total amount of production that's on, available online uh, today after four years of a license program, you still don't have 100,000 kilos being harvested. Right? So uh, eventually, is it possible? Sure. Uh, but I, I still think that the new licenses, uh, most of them are, are eventually going to pivot and end up focused on being a craft producer, focus on value-added products. Uh, mm. You know, we, we, we plan in our business model is the expectation that there will be enough supply. If you were to ask uh, Diageo or AB InBev, are you worried that uh, other people may be able to start breweries or you know, liquor companies? <laughs> They don't care. It's ha it, it, is your product good? Do people want your product over the next? Not right. is the product available? Sure. Huge advantage today that, that there is a, a shortage, but still, if your product's not good, someone will go to the black market. You bet. So what it comes down to is not who else is allowed to produce. It's can someone produce as well as you can produce? You know, are you keeping your customers happy? And that's the important thing. And if you are building your business on a regulatory barrier, you're going to fail. Hmm. All right, we'll leave it there for now. Mike, thanks for joining us today.